Once upon a time, Sound Blaster was a name that was synonymous with PC building and gaming. It was as essential a component as modern graphics cards are now. Though someone building their first gaming PC today might tilt their head and squint at you if you were to ask them about their sound card. This is because these days, most devices have excellent sound chips built into them, but this was not always the case. It's worthwhile to look back to the past and examine how PC sound has evolved, and ask the question, where did all the sound blasters go? Before we get into it, I would like to ask that if you enjoyed this video, please consider checking out my Ko-Fi page. These videos take a lot of time to research and edit, so a one-time small contribution goes a long way. If you don't have a couple spare dollars, liking the video and subbing to the channel is a free way to support as well. Now, without further ado, let's get back into it. In the 80s, the PC was only capable of speaking in mere beeps. Back in the 80s, IBM personal computers and compatibles were primarily focused on productivity. They were made for crunching numbers and writing reports. Aside from the little internal beepers intended for troubleshooting error codes, and the whirring hum of hard disks and floppy drives, the PC was a silent sentinel of the office desktop. A way that developers were able to get around the limited sound capability in PCs at the time was through a hack called 6-bit digitized sound, which worked by maximizing the single square wave output that the PC speaker was capable of. Examples of this could be heard in early King's Quest games. In 1984, IBM's PC Jr. would come equipped with the Texas Instruments SN76489 chip, which, at the time, was commonly found in arcade machines and the Sega Master System and Sega Genesis. This chip was quite a bit more robust than PC speakers, as it was able to generate three separate square waves at once. The Tandy 3 voice chip was also available and had similar capabilities. Unfortunately, the PC Jr. was not a capable gaming machine, and so triple voice chips would not regularly find their way into other models. If you wanted a device with good sound, your choices were either early Atari computers or Commodore devices. Chips found in these devices were typically able to handle 4-bit volume controls, which allowed developers to use high clock speeds to get impressive results out of them. This can be seen in Impossible Mission for the Commodore 64, and the impressive soundscape for Dungeon Master on the Atari ST. As cool as this stuff was, those on IBM PCs would be stuck conversing with R2-D2 whenever they booted up their programs. This was of course until 1987, when Canadian company Adlib released the PCMS, which was loaded with a Yamaha YM3812 FM synthesis chip, also known as the OPL2. This card was the first PC-compatible expansion card to gain significant software support from developers. While this card did not support digitized sound like chips found in the Atari and Commodore systems, it would also be the first to be supported by Sierra Games' King Quest IV, which would open the doors for an audio revolution in the PC gaming industry. Adlib would go on to become a powerhouse in the PC market. But across the sea, there was another major player that would soon become a household name to computer enthusiasts for years to come. In Singapore, the no U-turn without sign culture has permeated every level of our thinking. When there is no rule, we cannot do anything. We become paralyzed. We do not want to be paralyzed by waiting for the rule to be formulated before moving. It will be too late. In 1981, Sim Wong Hu founded Creative Technology with his childhood friends and classmates 
Eng Kai Wa, and Che Kwang Soon. They started as a humble computer repair shop in Singapore that also developed add-on memory modules for the Apple II. Creative Technology would start creating IBM clones in 1984 with the Cubic 99, which was the first PC to be designed and produced in Singapore. It was well regarded for its price and performance ratio, but was quickly overtaken in these categories by competing manufacturers. In 1986, Creative Technology would invest $500,000 to develop the Cubic CT, an IBM clone that was adapted for the Chinese language. It featured enhanced color graphics and a built-in audio board that was capable of producing speech and melodies. However, the Cubic would go on to become a commercial failure. The market for multilingual computers was minuscule and software support was just as barren. These initial speed bumps would not stop Sim Wong Hu, however, who was a driven businessman and culture contrarian. Since Creative was getting beaten out by competitors, Sim looked for gaps in the market where his company could secure a niche, and in 1987, they would exceed in doing just that. Shortly after the release of Adlib Sound Card in 1987, Creative released the Creative Music System Music Card. This PC-compatible ISA card was packed with two Philips SAA1099 chips, which were able to provide 12 voice square waves B-in-a-box stereo sound in addition to two noise channels. It would be released in the United States as the Game Blaster in 1988 in conjunction with Radio Shack's Tandy division. This also marks the formation of Creative Labs Incorporated, which its home office would be based in San Francisco, California. With the newly formed United States division and marketing from Radio Shack, Sim would be able to get several game developers on board to program native support into their games, which would cement Creative Labs as an industry staple in less than a year of coming on the market. Despite coming to the market after AdLib, Creative held a major advantage, location. Since common components and chips that were found on AdLib's expansion cards, such as the famous OPL2, were not proprietary, and the cost of labor was much lower in Singapore than in Canada, Creative was able to manufacture their own sound cards with the same components found on competing models for a fraction of the price. And those savings were passed on to the consumer, making Creative's offerings much more appealing to PC manufacturers and budget-minded PC builders. And though there were external devices on the market that had great sound capabilities such as the Roland MT32, which was also released in 1987, these devices were prohibitively expensive and not easily accessible to the average consumer. The Game Blaster was the clear choice for most folks in those days, and in 1989, this choice would only become clearer with the release of the Sound Blaster 1.0. The Sound Blaster 1.0 was the first PC sound card that truly supported digital sound. It had two different types of sound synthesis, MIDI, and joystick support. It came packed with two Yamaha OPL chips, which is what AdLib was basing most of their cards around at the time, meaning that most games that were programmed with AdLib compatibility were also compatible with Sound Blaster by default. The sound of the OPL chips is so iconic that modern clone cards are still being made to this day to properly capture the sound of the 90s. The decision to include joystick support on the card was an especially clever move, which further incentivized gamers to purchase the Sound Blaster. It really was just a consumer-friendly product. It's a triple win. The next notable release would be in 1991, which would see the release of the Sound Blaster Pro 1.0, which also sported two OPL2 chips, but was also the first Sound Blaster to comply with Microsoft's multimedia PC standard and thus it was also the first Sound Blaster to have CD-ROM support. The Sound Blaster Pro 2.0 would instead ship with the brand new YMF262 chip, or the OPL3. The core difference between running dual OPL2 chips versus one OPL3 chip is that OPL2s use 9-bit mono sound, and the OPL3 uses 18-bit stereo. So while extremely similar, the OPL3 is a step up in efficiency from a technical standpoint. 
though it was not always backwards compatible and could cause issues of programs that were specifically written to take advantage of dual OPL2s. Sound Blaster would go on through the 90s as a quintessential PC sound card. However, Creative would see some turbulence back home in Singapore. In 1995, CTO and co-founder Ng Kai Wa would resign from the company, followed by Chief Operating Officer and the other co-founder, Chai Kwang Soon, in 1996. In addition to changes in leadership, according to the National Library Board of Singapore, Creative would register its first ever full year net loss for the fiscal year ending in June 1996. Creative attributes this loss to the $20 million USD write-down of four-speed CD-ROM drives that had been made obsolete. Creative was having issues at this time finding new products that could match the success of the Sound Blaster. They would spend the next few years researching new technologies and trying to find their new niche. Sim Wong Hu is not one to give up. He's always willing to make that U-turn despite there being no signs. In 1999, Creative would announce their intention to shift directions and tackle new markets such as personal digital entertainment products, that didn't go well, 3D gaming cards, and most importantly, continued production of the new Sound Blaster cards. The 2000s would see cards like the Sound Blaster Odigy, which had hardware accelerated DS3D sound, and the Odigy 2ZS, which had 7.1 surround sound. I actually have this card loaded up in my XP machine, featured in another video, and it's an absolute monster. In 2004, the Sound Blaster Extagy took a different approach, being an external USB unit which was reminiscent of the hi-fi staples of the 80s, such as the Roland MT32. To me, this marks the new direction of Creative as a whole, and their new focus on external devices. With the way the industry was changing in the late 2000s, the Sound Blaster as an expansion was becoming unneeded. Capable sound chips were coming standard on new motherboards, and only audiophiles and professional studio engineers were really in need of good sound cards to add into their PCs. Creative, which was once known as a budget warrior sound card, shifted gears and began offering high quality boutique items such as their Katana soundbars. But it seems that they have not forgotten their roots. They still do have affordable offerings in their Pebble PC speakers and various models of headphones, but where have all the Sound Blasters gone? Despite all the issues in the 90s and early 2000s, Creative never stopped making Sound Blasters. A Sound Blaster can now take the form of a desktop or portable amplifier that works directly with your device, or even your game console, but they also still make internal sound cards just like the old days. You can still have a Sound Blaster Autogy FX for between 40 and 60 USD. Their upper end model, the Sound Blaster AE9, features bi amplification and an external control module that also acts as a recording interface for traditional microphones. It even has 48 volt phantom power, how neat. The best part is that they've shrunken down the Sound Blasters to fit into a PCIe X1 slot. While sound cards might not be the essential PC building component that they used to be, they can still up your audio game for a solid price or significantly boost your sound into professional territory with their higher tiered offerings, which, when compared to other professional audio interfaces, is still a pretty reasonable price. Creative Labs has been chugging away all these years, innovating and improving the beloved Sound Blaster. So to answer the question, where did all the Sound Blasters go? The answer is nowhere. They're still right here, where they've always been, and likely where they'll remain. In our hearts, and on the shelf at Micro Center. Thank you for making it to the end of the video. Uh, that means a lot to me. This video is kind of shorter than I wanted it to be, uh, but it took so much time to get into fruition. Uh, editing it was a, a, a learning process, and I just wanted to thank all, of, all the subscribers that joined me back in October when I started up the channel and have patiently awaited the releasing of this one. I'm hoping the next video will not take as long to make. Uh, I'm going to be going back to some build videos for a while until I find another uh, worthy research topic. And, you know, until then, uh, like, subscribe, it helps a ton. Check out my Ko-Fi page um, where you can find some other things that I do and, uh, you know, help support the show. And otherwise, thank you and have a wonderful day.